Good afternoon. The first item of business is portfolio questions, and the portfolio this afternoon is education and skills. If a member would wish to seek to request a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button or enter the letters RTS in the uh, chat function during the relevant question. I call question number one, Mark Griffin, who is joining us remotely. Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the processing of appeals for the 2022 National Qualifications Exams. Cabinet Secretary Shirley Ann Somerville. Outcomes for priority appeals where outcomes were needed for progression to further education, higher education and employment or training this year were issued to centres by the SQA on the 5th of September. Outcomes for the remaining 2020 appeals process were issued on the 31st of October, with some having been expedited to the 15th of October for learners who were accessing the UCAS early applicant process for 2023 for courses such as medicine or dentistry. The SK published a high-level summary of the 2022 appeals outcomes on the 3rd of November, and a more detailed report will be published by the SQA in December. Mark Griffin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. With a third of appeals in 2022 being successful, I think it helped ensure fairness and mitigate the ongoing effects of the global pandemic. But with the pandemic still affecting young people's education, can the Cabinet Secretary say whether she agrees that the SQA should commit to an appeals process for 2023 based on um, valid and re reliable um, alternative evidence of demonstrated attainment? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the SQA um, still have a number of decisions to be made, particularly around uh, the appeals uh, process. Uh, they are currently undertaking uh, consultation and uh, research and evidence work uh, to see about the implications both of uh, the appeals process last year, uh, but also obviously to look at how appeals have worked in uh, previous years. Uh, clearly, that work is ongoing through the SQA, and of course, during that work, they'll also keep in close contact with the National Qualifications 23 group, uh, which. Uh, it includes a number of stakeholders, including learners, uh, to see what uh, their views are before the SQA comes to any decisions for 2023. Question number two, Miles Briggs. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to learners of English as an additional language. Cabinet Secretary. The responsibility for the provision of support to children and young people who have English as an additional language rests with education authorities. Under the Additional Support for Learning Act, education authorities are legally required to identify, provide for and to review the additional support needs of their pupils. This includes those pupils who have English as an additional language. The Scottish Government has provided statutory guidance to education authorities and schools to support them in fulfilling their duties. English as additional language has been specifically identified as a potential additional support need within the Code of Practice. Miles Briggs. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Over the last decade here in Edinburgh, um, the number of children in schools new to English has increased from 585 to over uh, 760. Also, in terms of early acquisition of English as a language, has increased from 800 to over 1800. But we haven't seen the increase in additional language teachers in our schools. So, could I ask um, what assurance can the Cabinet Secretary provide that councils such as Edinburgh will be given the funding needed? for English as additional language teachers to make the most of our multilingual classrooms. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I completely uh, appreciate uh, where Miles Briggs is coming from uh, with this question to ensure that we are providing uh, support uh, for those uh, that have English as an additional language. Uh, many of the responsibilities, as I said in my original answer, do of course lie with the local authority to ensure there is identification of need and the correct support available. Clearly, the Scottish Government and indeed the Education Scotland work very closely with our local authorities uh, to ensure that anything that can be done at a national level uh, to assist with that uh, can be done. Uh, clearly, there are also uh, a number of ways where funding is given to local authorities, um, either through general expenditure um, or particularly for um, some education um, aspects of policy. Uh, many of those go through COSLA and the requirement uh, of an agreement with COSLA about how that money is distributed. But I will certainly um, ensure that we bear in mind in future years the importance um, of this, as we have done in the past. 
Supplementary, Michael Murray. Uh, thank you, President Officer. A, a particularly important question today on International Students' Day, uh, when we reflect on the contribution that uh, the, the, our international community makes in Scotland and uh, more broadly as our students go across the world. Um, but frankly, the, the, uh, uh, the Cabinet Secretary's answer is not good enough. There has been an 82 per cent decrease in the number of teachers with English and additional language since 2008 in Scotland. It is clear that the system she outlines is not working and the Government needs to take an active role in addressing the problem. What more can she commit to do to actually put in place a government programme to sort this situation out? Cabinet Secretary. Well, clearly what the government continues uh, to do is ensure that we are investing in teachers and um, within uh, the teaching estate. Teacher numbers are now at their highest since 2008, and the most recently available figures show that there's more than 16,000 pupil support assistants in Scotland that are also providing invaluable support to pupils, including those with English as additional language. Question number three, Maggie Chapman. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will, will provide an update on how further and higher education institutions that receive public funding via the Scottish Funding Council are expected to implement Fair Work First principles. Minister Jamie Hepburn. The Scottish Government strongly believes that all employers should practice fair work. The Scottish Funding Council asks institutions in receipt of public funding to comply with Fair Work First criteria through a number of mechanisms. The criteria were included in institutional funding letters issued in May 2022 and also in the conditions of grant for non-core programme funds. In addition, the SFC Outcome Agreement guidance for uh, academic year 22-23 asks institutions to demonstrate how they are meeting Fair Work First criteria. SFC account directions also require colleges and universities to report on Fair Work practices that have been developed in agreement with the institution's workforce and the progress that colleges and universities have made in their implementation. The SFC is due to receive 21-22 accounts from institutions at the end of this calendar year. Michael Chapman. I thank the Minister for that response. He will be aware that effective voice is one of the five dimensions of fair work as defined by the Fair Work Convention. Indeed, they say the gold standard of effective voice is employers having clear recognition of and respect for strong trade unions. Yesterday marked the end of 12 weeks of strike action, and today is, the six, is day 613 since the pensions dispute with Unite the Union and Dundee University began. Workers go back to work without any resolution. University management has comprehensively failed. Ms. Chapman, could we have a question, please? Thank you. In its to, to, uh, under the Fair Work Effective Voice criterion, they have refused to engage. But with Ms. The Chapman, unions. I really do need a question. Does the please minister get to the believe question. that this is fair work practice? effectively de-recognising the campus unions. What can we do, what can he do, either through the FSC, the outcome agreement discussions with Dundee University, to ensure that workers' voices are heard and they are treated... Mr Chapman, I think we've got the gist. Thank you very much, Minister. ...and in retirement. Mr Chapman, thank you. Yeah, well, let me say, as a, a former Fair Work Minister, I, I take these issues very seriously. I do agree that trade union recognition and the organisation of workers through trade unions is an important uh, mechanism for effective voice. In relation to this particular uh, dispute, I have uh, urged both sides throughout uh, the dispute to continue constructive and meaningful uh, dialogue. I have engaged regularly uh, with both uh, management and uh, trade unions involved on, uh, 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 on an ongoing uh, basis. Most recently, I spoke with uh, Ian Gillespie, the principal of the University on 3rd of November, to encourage further dialogue between the university and trade unions, and it follows previous engagement with him and with the trade unions more widely. A supplementary, Pam Gozo. Thank you, officer. Colleges need £25 million for life cycle maintenance for 2023 to 2024, with further £250 million needed to bring all of Scotland's college buildings to a wind and watertight condition. A warm, dry environment suitable for learning is the bare minimum that staff and students should expect. Does the Minister agree with me, and will he make room in the budget to ensure that bare minimum working conditions for colleges and staff and students? Minister. Well, I am aware of some of the challenges we face in our college estate. What we have asked SFC to undertake is to take forward uh, a programme to set out what the priorities for investment should be. I await that and then we will respond. But yes, I recognise the challenges. Yes, we will continue to invest. There is a significant uplift in the capital grant this year, demonstrating our commitment to invest in the college state. But I recognise that more requires to be done and we will continue to engage with the sector on that basis. Question number four, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what proportion of the 2021 graduate probationary primary teachers have secured full-time employment in Scottish state schools after completing their probation? Cabinet Secretary. 
for primary teachers in the 2021 cohort, the teacher induction scheme probationers, 70% had secured full-time employment in a publicly funded school in Scotland by the time of the September 2021 census. Statistics on the employment for the 21-22 cohort of teacher induction scheme probationers will be published on the 13th of December. Colin Smith. Primary teachers who carry out their probation in Dumfries and Galloway have one of the lowest rates of permanent employment. Only three teachers, that's just 6% of the 2021 cohort, secured a permanent teaching position. One of the many teachers stuck on supply list wrote to me and asked, myself, like many others, have worked hard to get to where we are. Teachers are unvalued. So many are looking to leave the profession. I feel like my life is on hold. I can't plan for the future. Do you think this is fair? Cabinet Secretary, there's a problem across Scotland, but especially in rural areas. So what additional steps will will the government take to support local authorities, particularly in rural areas, to fill teaching vacancies and enable those newly qualified teachers to pursue the career they want? Because my constituent is right, it's not fair. Well, recruitment and retention um, of teachers is a matter for the local authority as uh, the employer. Um, we have clearly, uh, however, got a role at a national level to support our local authorities, but that's exactly why I took the step to ensure that we provided additional permanent funding of £145.5 million per year to support the recruitment of extra teachers. Local authorities had told me in the past that one of the reasons why they couldn't allow permanent uh, contracts was because some of our funding was temporary. I have changed that. The funding is permanent, and therefore local authorities should be replying on a permanent basis for contracts. I have uh, three members seeking a supplementary. I'll take all three. I hope there won't be endless uh, sub, uh, you know, sub clauses before we get to a question. Uh, Willie Rennie. Um, to, <laughs> uh, to give the Cabinet Secretary credit, she did baseline that funding, which has helped mitigate some of the problems. But there continues to be a mismatch between the teachers available and the posts available. So what changes is she making to workforce planning? What discussions has she had with the universities and what further steps is she going to take to make sure these people find jobs? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I continue to be in close contact uh, with unions um, and uh, with teachers directly, uh, who I've heard from once again quite recently um, about some of the challenges they face on permanent contracts. Clearly, we're looking at the numbers that are required for initial teacher education um, numbers um, at this point. Um, I, those uh, deliberations are still ongoing, but clearly that feeds into our wider workforce plans. It looks at the number of teachers uh, that are in the system at the moment and therefore the requirement for uh, additional teachers teachers um, in different places. So that work obviously includes uh, those uh, that are in our university sector providing that initial teacher education and of course those pub uh, figures will be published in due course once it's completed. Supplementary Stephen Kerr. But Cabinet Secretary that response is really not good enough. None of your responses to this question will be good enough because we know there are thousands of newly qualified teachers that have left the profession or are on temporary contracts and the figures reported uh, by the Times uh, should be a reflection of shame for the Cabinet Secretary. We have a situation where there are teachers that have reached the end of their tether, have quit the profession or have been left in limbo for far too long in temporary contracts. These issues have been raised for years in this chamber and it simply isn't good enough for the Cabinet Secretary to sit on her... Sit Could on we her, then get a question, please, I will. I, I promise I will. Sit on her, sit on her hands, Deputy Presiding Officer. What will she do now to fix it? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. Well, uh, clearly, uh, as I've already stated in my uh, previous answers, uh, we have uh, done a lot, particularly this year, £145.5 million worth is the change uh, that we have um, made for that. Uh, but I would again stress to all members, they are perfectly entitled, of course they are, to challenge the Scottish Government on this. None of the, the, the questions today have recognised the role of councils in this to also look at the permanency of this issue and the fact that they have responsibility for recruitment and intention. So yes, I absolutely take uh, my responsibilities very seriously. That's exactly why I took the decision I did uh, not long after getting into post. But councils also have a responsibility around recruitment and retention. And I fear the members don't recognise that. Certainly Mr Kerr did not. Supplementary, Evelyn Tweed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome the support the Scottish Government is providing for the continued employment of teachers. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary for the latest pupil to teacher ratio and how this compares with the rest of the UK? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, the ratio of pupil to teachers is at its lowest since 2009, with more teachers than at any time since 2008, and we have the most teachers per pupil of any UK nation. The latest comparable statistics are for 2021 and show a pupil teacher ratio of 13.3 for Scotland, 18 for England, 19.2 for Wales, and 18 for Northern Ireland. Question number five, Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to improve positive destinations for young disabled people leaving school. Cabinet Secretary. Since November 2020, we have invested funding of up to £175 million through the Young Persons Guarantee to create additional opportunities with a focus on those furthest from a positive destination. This includes up to £90 million to local authorities through local employment partnerships. These are focused on early intervention and prevention by providing supported employment opportunities, training and employer recruitment initiatives. The Scottish Government is also committed to introducing Scotland's first national transitions to adulthood strategy in this parliamentary term to ensure there is a joined-up approach to supporting our disabled young people as they make the transition to adult life. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. When it comes to positive destinations for young disabled people, the picture is not good. Six months after leaving school, disabled people are twice as likely not to be in education, employment or training than their non-disabled peers. At the age of 16, the aspirations of disabled and non-disabled young people are the same. By 26, disabled people are three times more likely to feel hopeless no matter what they do. We are failing them at a time when we should be helping them fulfil their dreams. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that to improve positive destinations for disabled people leaving school, a national transition strategy with a plan for all young disabled people should be put on a statutory footing, giving everyone a fighting chance at a future? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, can I recognise uh, the work that has been undertaken um, by the member um, on the, the bill on this issue and very much recognise uh, that that is an ongoing process um, at the moment. Uh, we do absolutely support the intention behind the member's bill in seeking to improve the transition um, for disabled children and young people. I, I think we are at the point where we need to collectively consider where uh, this is at, given um, the, the consultation that is ongoing and the work that is ongoing on that but I do genuinely look forward to working uh, collaboratively with Pam Duncan Glancy um, on this, um, as does my um, colleague uh, Claire Hockey and also Christina McKelvey, uh, who are working on this bill and the wider issues uh, around transitions. A supplementary, Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome an update from the Scottish Government on what it is doing to improve positive destinations for disabled people leaving school. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how many people are accessing modern apprenticeships and how this compares to pre-pandemic numbers? Cabinet Secretary. Skills Development Scotland has operational responsibilities for our modern apprenticeship programme and official modern apprenticeship statistics are published quarterly uh, by them, including the number of starts, the full year report available at the end of each financial year. So the most recent statistics were published on the 8th of November. There were 12,593 modern apprenticeship starts by the end of quarter two. This has been considerable progress back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, 1,822 modern apprenticeship starts in the second quarter have a known disability or have self-identified with an impairment, a health condition or learning dis difficulty. And this is an increase of 36.6% up from 1,334 at the same point last year. Question number six, Russell Finlay. Oh, thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to keep teachers and pupils safe while at school. Cabinet Secretary. The safety of our children, young people and staff in schools is of paramount importance. The Scottish Government and partners across, ad, across education advocate for schools and local authorities to work with pupils in identifying the underlying reasons for inappropriate behaviour. We all want pupils to behave in a respectful manner towards their peers and their staff and have produced guidance for local authorities and schools to prevent exclusions and manage behaviour. However, it is for schools to decide what actions should be taken depending on the individual circumstances of each case. Russell Finlay. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Uh, now, in Renfrewshire, with over a single year, 36 teachers were assaulted by pupils, with 28 of these attacks being in primary schools. Violence has reached such extreme levels in one Glasgow secondary school that teachers have voted for strike action because they do not feel safe. Yet there remains a real risk that proposed SNP budget cuts to justice will lead to the loss of police officers in schools. Mm -hmm. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain how cutting campus cops will help teachers stay safe? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> 
So for the avoidance and doubt, and particularly for the benefit of Mr Rennie, we do not have campus cops within our schools. I see he's left presiding officer, but he has had an interest in this area in past. We do not have campus cops eh, within our schools. What we do have are police officers eh, who work with a school, primary or secondary, um, on issues that are of um, interest and, and use. What it is important to ensure is that police officers, of course, eh, support our schools wherever necessary um, if there is a requirement for a police officer eh, to carry out that type of role eh, within their school. Eh, they do just that very well and with great support at the moment, but we will continue to ensure that we support our teachers to ensure that we know that no one should be suffering verbal or physical abuse within our schools. There is an absolute responsibility on schools and local authorities to decide what action should be taken. That may involve involving the police if that is appropriate, but that is a decision for the school and that would be very different from some of the funds that have been used from pupil equity funding eh, to support joint work with a police officer. Supplementary, Martin Whitfield. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. In terms of a risk register of green, amber, red, where does violence within schools sit with the Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I already said in my, my um, answer that there is absolutely no excuse um, and, uh, for violence within our schools. All forms of violence is absolutely um, unacceptable. So there is a clear policy, both at a government and I think at a, a local government level as well, that this type of behaviour is absolutely unacceptable. That's why we've got the guidance in place that we have and that's why we continue to have very close dialogue with the unions um, and with local authorities to see if there's anything else that can be done on this issue. And supplementary uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, um, on the back of Russell Finlay's question and her answer, for an update on when we should expect the next iteration of the behaviour in Scottish schools research to start and how the findings of this research impacts on Scottish Government policy? Cabinet Secretary. So I'm pleased to confirm that after a delay caused by the pandemic, we've recently awarded the contract for the next phase of behaviour in Scottish schools research to Scotsend Social Research. Officials are working with analysts and the contractor to make arrangements for the fieldwork, which will start next year. We expect the research uh, report by the end of 2023. Question number seven, Claire Baker. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it is ensuring adequate support provision is available for staff and pupils in schools. Cabinet Secretary. All children and young people should receive the support they need to receive their full potential, and I recognise the critical role of all school staff in achieving the same and remain committed to supporting them in their work. Local authorities are responsible for identifying and meeting the additional support needs of their pupils, and we are working closely with local government partners through the Additional Support for Learning Project Board to ensure we continue to see progress with the delivery of the recommendations from the Angela Morgan's review. An updated action plan and progress report will be published shortly. Clear Baker. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Um, the latest Scottish Government figures show that over 12,000 children and young people access school counselling services over the last six months of the last year. What assurances can the Cabinet Secretary offer regarding the continued provision of pupil support services? And can she guarantee that the government funding, which came from the National Mental Health Strategy, um, that goes towards the school counselling service, which is due to be reviewed in March, that that will be continued because the need is obviously there. And many of the councils are on fixed term contracts um, and we need to make sure they have some certainty so the service can be maintained and provided. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I thank Claire Baker for that question and also uh, very um, strongly um, recognise uh, the work that has gone on within our schools, particularly the school counselling service, which, as she says, the Scottish Government had committed funding for. Uh, the funding for that actually is within the health budget rather than the, the um, education um, budget. Clearly, as we move into the uh, new budget process uh, for the next year, um, the ministers right across government um, will be analysing um, how our budget should be spent um, and on these issues, of course, of course, um, the Minister um, for um, Mental Health and myself uh, will be in close contact about what will happen in future years on this. As I, I do recognise this has been an important uh, and significant scheme. It's not the only scheme, of course, that's out there uh, to assist um, children and uh, young people, but this will be something we will look at in the budget process moving forward. And question number eight, Jenny Minto. To ask the Scottish Government how many children in Argyll and Butte are currently receiving funded early learning and childcare. Minister Clare Hockey. 
recently published figures show numbers of children receiving funded early learning and childcare at the local authority level are included in the summary statistics for schools in Scotland report for 2021. This was published in December 2021 and showed that in September 2021 there were 1,303 registrations for funded ELC in Argyll and Butte, a rise of 4.6% from the previous year. In December, the Scottish Government will publish the summary statistics for Schools in Scotland report for 2022. And this will report uh, figures to show the number of child registrations for funded early learning and childcare in September 2020 at national and local authority level, including Argyll and Butte. Jenny Minto. Thank the Minister for that answer. I have had the privilege of visiting the wonderful outdoor ELC facilities at Loch Gilphead in my constituency and have seen the benefits to children's education that these provide. Could the Minister advise what the Scottish Government can do to promote outdoor education for nursery age children? Minister. Uh, outdoor play and learning is already an integral everyday part of ELC in Scotland and we know the benefits of high quality outdoor play on children's positive physical and mental development. It is our vision that children in Scotland's ELC sector will spend as much time outdoors as they do indoors and time outdoors will happen every day in every setting. As outlined in the Best Start Strategic Early Learning and School Age Childcare Plan for Scotland published on the 6th of October. We will continue to work with our partners to build on the range of outdoor learning support for providers that we put in place during the pandemic. And this will include publishing a new chapter of our popular Out to Play ELC Practitioner Guidance series in the new year entitled Caring for Our Outdoor Places. The guidance will set out sustainable ways to explore, look after and care for our outdoor spaces. And supplementary Sue Weber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Argyle and Butte is leading the way when it comes to funding following the child with some of their cross-border early learning childcare placement arrangements, offering real flexibility to suit the child and, equally important, the working parent and carer. However, this is not the case nationally. I have a constituent that lives in South West Edinburgh but works as a teacher in East Lothian. The care available to her from the City of Edinburgh Council does not suit her work or commuter challenges, and they might be best suited with a placement in a neighbouring authority, for example, East Lothian. Does the Minister agree that, given the pressures of juggling work and childcare, local government should be looking to remove obstacles and make it easier for families to access the 1140 hours that they need by actively encouraging local authorities to facilitate cross-boundary placements? Minister. So, um, provider neutrality is absolutely central to our approach to delivering ELC, which means that parents and carers can choose to access their child's ELC entitlement in any provider that meets our key quality criteria, whether that was a childminder, a private or third sector setting, or a local authority nursery. I'd certainly be happy if Sue Weber wanted to write with, to me with those specific details to come back to her on anything that we can do to assist. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on education and skills. There will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow front bench teams to change positions should they wish. Thank you.